So I thank you for coming. I want to introduce our speaker now. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Jennifer Mangan from JMU to come and speak to us about climate change. Uh, I can't think of another expert on campus about climate change. She did her undergraduate degree degree in uh, at uh, Rutgers in biology, a master's degree in studying climate change at Penn State, and then her PhD, again studying climate change uh, at the University of Colorado Boulder. She then did a postdoc at NCAR, which is the National Center for Atmospheric Research uh, in Boulder before coming to JMU uh, last September when I came to JMU as well. So we're really honored and very excited to have Dr. Mangan speak to us about climate change through the ages. Thanks, Jennifer. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that very touching welcome. And thank you all for coming out on this, as we said, a very nice Friday evening to hear about science. So that's very exciting that we're going to improve the science literacy of this small corner of the world. So welcome and thank you. So we're going to have uh, something of a light dialogue about a sort of serious issue. You've all heard about global warming and climate change is pretty pr prominent in the news these days. And what we're going to look at is mostly the last 2,000 years. And we're going to look at it from a more historical point of view and a more human point of view. So we're going to put a little bit more of a human face on it than you often see when you're looking at um, stuff about climate change. A lot of times you hear about data and numbers and a lot of doomsday scenarios. But we're going to see how it's impacted people in the past, what's going on today, and why we should care. So let's start with this first slide here. One of the things that a lot of people don't realize and that tends to surprise them is that throughout much of Earth's history, we're talking about the large span of Earth's history since it cooled off from being a big molten ball of lava, is that Earth's climate has usually been actually warmer than today. So in the grand scheme of things, we are actually in a somewhat cool period in all of Earth's history. Now that's not to say that things aren't heating up and that's not going to have profound impacts, but in reality, it was as much as 8 to 15 degrees Celsius warmer than it was today. And that's a lot. I know in this country we tend to think in Fahrenheit, so 8 to 15 degrees Celsius is a more significant temperature deviation than if you were thinking of that in Fahrenheit. So Earth has actually been a lot warmer than today. It could even have been 877 degrees at one point, although not while you were alive, probably. So. Looking at that long-term temperature record, because Earth was so much warmer, the poles, which we tend to think of as being like covered with ice and chronically covered with ice, that wasn't always true. And in fact, paleontologists have found fossils of palm trees as far north as the Arctic Circle. And that's not because somebody brought a palm tree there and it naturally died and they just left it outside. That's because once upon a time it was warm enough up at the Arctic Circle, way up in northern Alaska, for palm trees to actually live. So these warm climates where the poles were ice free were periodically interrupted by what we call periods of glaciation. And to you, these might be known more familiarly as the Ice Ages. Ice Age, you've all heard of Ice Age. They made a big cartoon movie with Ray Romano. At least you've probably heard of that. That featured lots of glaciers. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about glaciation. There was a big one about 700 million years ago. There was another big one about 300 million years ago that corresponded incidentally with um, a mass extinction. And more recently, the Ice Age, about which that movie was made and that we tend to think of when we think of an Ice Age, was actually a series of four fairly rapid succession glaciations that started about 2 million years ago and ended roughly 10, 8 to 10,000 years ago. So over that span from 2 million years to about 10,000 years ago, we had four successive ice ages, and that was also known as the Pleistocene epoch to geologists. And this is what it looked like at the peak of the end of that last ice age. There was a big ice sheet called the Laurentide Ice Sheet, which covered much of Canada, or all of Canada, Canada and much of the northern United States. And it reached its maximum thickness about 18 to 22,000 years ago. And it was several miles thick in some places. That's how massive this ice sheet was. That's how cold it was. And you can see that the end of that ice sheet reaches right down about I don't have a pointer, but it reaches right down about um, where, that's New Jersey on the east coast of the United States there. 
and the Delmarva Peninsula. Oh, thank you. That button right there, thank you. So right there, and the, this leading edge of that ice sheet is actually where Long Island is today. So that's, Long Island is what we call the terminal moraine of the Laurentide ice sheet, which is a fancy way of saying that Long Island is a bunch of garbage left over from a big glacier, which makes it sound a lot less swank, doesn't it? Another big thing that happened when this ice sheet was covering North America was sea level went down because all of the water here in the oceans was locked up in that ice sheet. So because sea level was lower, you could have more land exposed. And we think that the first people to actually populate North America walked across up here, what we call the Bering Land Bridge up here in the Bering Sea, because there was an ocean between Alaska and what's today um, Siberia, Northern Asia. So we think that because of this ice age, the first people were able to come down and inhabit North America. So that was one thing, that was one big thing that happened during this last big ice age. This ice age came crashing to an end about 14,000 years ago. Glaciers started to retreat. And you can see from this graph here, this is a fun graph, it looks like a lot of squiggly lines. If you have a toddler in your house, you may have artwork that looks like this. But in this case, it is actually a graph of the temperature record. And you can see it was way cold back here when those ice sheets were at their maximum thickness. It got warmer and warmer and warmer. And then a period called the Younger Dryas happened. That was a really brief blip on the radar as far as we're concerned. It got very cold again, very suddenly, but look how quickly it rebounded. And boy, did it rebound. About 6,000 years ago, it was much warmer than today. The interior of the United States, which today we think of as like being the breadbasket of the country and where we grow lots of grass and cows and grass and cows, was a big desert with lots of sand and blowing dust, kind of like the Dust Bowl of the 1930s because it was so hot, nothing could grow there. And then came the last 2,000 years, which is really what we're going to focus mostly on right now. And the last 2,000 years are pretty interesting, um, especially starting around, not even 2,000 years ago, right around the year 800, leading all the way into the year about 1,200. Because if you look at them, they are periods that significantly deviate from the climate that we have today, and yet they are much different than what's going on with the climate today. So it's interesting to look at these from the historical point of view to see what happened then, how did it impact people, but how is it very different from what the situation we're facing today with, with climate change and global warming issues. So first, let's look at the medieval warm period. That's also called the medieval climactic optimum by scientists who like to sound smart. And if you look between the years 800 and 1200, you can see it's quite a bit warmer than the average temperature. So temperatures are, are quite a bit above average. How do we know this? Well, we have what we call proxy data. Proxy data are substitute data for actual measurements where people went out and recorded the temperature every day. They didn't really have little rain gauges. You could go to the Home Depot or L old, ye old Home Depot and buy a little rain gauge thing back in the year 1000. So we rely on things like traveler's records, farmer's logs, and things like that. So during the years 800 to 1200, one of the ways that we know that it was much warmer then comes from stories of the Vikings. You may have heard of the Vikings. They were guys that looked kind of like this. They got in their boats with their regulation life jackets and horned helmets and rowed across the sea, right? Well, almost, but not quite. Um, Iceland and Greenland, which are fairly northern countries in the North Atlantic Sea, they were settled by these people called the Vikings. And they were collectively the Norse, which included people from Norway, Sweden. They were also the Danes and the Finns. So they, it was a collective term for these people. And there are no reports of drift ice from their sailing records in the North Atlantic during the years 800 to 1200. The first report of drift ice in these Vikings sailing logs 
appear about 1300 AD. And that's important, think about that. These guys, this is their living. They spend most of their lives out on the ocean. So naturally, they're going to keep detailed logs of what they're doing, where they're going, and the sailing conditions. So the fact that these drift ice doesn't appear in the record until 1300 AD is pretty important. So that's a good clue from the human record as far as what was going on. And the story behind this picture, which is pretty interesting, these are actual descendants of Vikings, these guys. And what they did one day uh, about a decade ago was they put on their Viking helmets and these, and they rode from their home country to Ireland to apologize for their ancestors coming and pillaging Ireland back in the 1100s. So I think it was a very nice gesture on their part, actually. So that, that's a true story. I'm not making that up. You can't make that stuff up. So part of the point of this story, if you look, I know there's a big busy map with a lot of arrows, <laughs> but if you look at this, you can see these little black lines here. Those show the Viking routes that they took in boats that look like this, a lot like this. This is an actual replica of a real Viking boat that they sailed in between the years 800 and 1200. And this is interesting and important because you think about, would you go out to sea in a boat that looked like that if there were big massive glaciers everywhere? Probably not. Think about the Titanic set sail from much further south. The Titanic was a sturdier, stronger boat than this and got sunk by an iceberg way far south of where these Vikings sailed. So there's no way these guys could have gone out to sea and sailed in these waters up here. There's the Arctic Circle in a boat that looks like that had there been anything resembling even a tiny glacier. So again, this is an important clue to the climate at that time. It must have been much warmer back then for there to be no drift ice so far north that they were able to go out in a boat that looks like that. So this brings us to a story. Does everybody like a good story? I like a good story. This is even more fun when you act it out with Barbie dolls, but we're not going to do that tonight. So this is a true story. Um, there was a guy in the year 960. His name was Thorvald Asfaltsen. He lived in Norway, and he killed a man. So his punishment was banishment. So he packed up and left. They banished him, and he moved to Iceland. So he didn't want to be all alone, so he took his family with him, including his 10-year-old son, who studied his father carefully, as, as sons often do. His son was named Eric, later became famously known or infamously known as Eric the Red. You may have heard of him in lore. And this is allegedly an actual picture of this guy Thorvald. So he packed up his family and moved to Iceland. Well, Eric, he grew up and wanted to be just like Daddy. So he killed two men. And they said, all right, now you're banished from Iceland. So Eric packed up and moved. So he was only banished for three years. He wasn't banished for a whole lifetime. So he, he got on his boat, and he sailed west from Iceland to a land that Icelanders, they knew about it. They didn't know a lot about it. They knew it was there. They discovered it, and they were aware of it. So Eric, and he went to this land, and he searched the coast. He sailed up and down. And he found the most hospitable area that he could find, which was a deep fjord on the southwestern coast of this land. So, I mean, he had nothing better to do, right? He had three years, three years to kill. And this is a picture of a fjord right there. A fjord's a nice little inlet off the ocean into land like that, in case you're wondering what a fjord is. And I know that's a lot of words, so I will, I will condense this story for you. So conditions in this land were not that much different from Iceland. You got warm currents coming up from the tropics in the ocean. So those warm currents make this land a little bit warmer than it would normally be for being so far north. So, and also it was an unusually warm period in time. So combined with that, he found a land that had some trees and some grasses, which we don't have there so much today. And so he was lonely, so he decided, I'm going to call this land Greenland. It's not really green, but people are more likely to come and join me in my banishment if um, the country has a beautiful name. Because if he called it land of mangy dirt and rocks and ice, people probably would not want to come and spend his banishment with him. But if they called it something nice, I mean, would you rather go to Happy Playland or to, like, Grungy Diner? So think about it from that point of view. 
the land wasn't very good for farming, but Eric, in I guess he was a charming dude, even though he was a convicted murderer and he'd sailed to this land that wasn't that hospitable, he convinced thousands of people to come join him in his banishment to the three different areas. So this land is Greenland. And there it is, there's a picture of what it looks like. And it's distance from Iceland. He could not have gotten there had there been ice there. And these are his settlements, one, two, and three. And he established those three colonies in his banishment and people lived there for quite a number of years. Even though he was only um, banned for three years, people settled there and they made a lifetime there. They, they settled there for life. Um, so the point of this, this story, which may seem very out of place when we're talking about climate change, but there is one. This is a great example of how historical records here are an indicator of climate. Now they don't stand alone as an indicator of climate. You've got a few boating records, but they're a great jumping off point if you want to learn more about, well, what was it really like? We had these ancient traveler's logs and they say there was no ice. What's that about? Maybe we can do some investigation of this and look at some other data and get some ideas of, well, what were the temperatures? So historical records, and it also puts a human face on it a little bit. Say, so, well, this, these are actual people that were affected by this. So the ancient Vikings have ne could never have sailed to, much less settled, Iceland in the first place or Greenland had the climate been any cooler. So these historical records plus proxy data are evidence. This is part of the evidence, part of the story about that medieval warm period. But wait, there's more. So either that will elicit a collective groan or you'll be very happy because you like this story. So it's a good one, it's a good story. Eventually those Norse settlements died out. They died out around 1300. We have records of this from people's logs and diaries. Around 1300, if you think back a few slides, that's when climate started to cool. That medieval climate, climatic optimum was at its peak during 800 and 1200. 1300, it was colder. So. Climatic changes are not believed to be the sole cause of the extinction of the Norse, but it was likely one of the main stresses. You think you've got this place, it's Greenland, it's north of the Arctic Circle, it's not that hospitable to begin with. It's a place that's kind of fragile, balancing on the edge there, and if it takes a turn for the cooler, that's going to be it. So. This is one of the stresses that we had on those remote Norse Greenlanders. It just got cold, it was hard enough to farm, and now it's just, it's just really too cold. So it wasn't as much fun as those Playmobil sets make it out to be. So corroboration of this. So in addition to those written records of the Vikings, one of the things we have is ice core evidence. And if you look at this bottom picture, this is a guy with an ice core. Every summer, Scientists go up to the Greenland ice sheet and they go to places in the Arctic where the ice is still quite thick and they drill into it and they get cores that are really long, very, very deep into the earth. And these cores are deposited in layers every year, kind of like tree rings. And what you can do is you can actually match those layers to specific years. So that's what these people have done. They bring these big cores back to their personal gigantic walk-in freezers at whatever university they're at, and they match the corresponding ice core ring to a certain year, and then they can analyze. They can analyze things like oxygen isotopes in it. And by looking at the ratio of certain types of oxygen versus normal oxygen, they have figured out a technique to actually pinpoint, oh, I have this ratio of heavy oxygen to normal oxygen, that means the temperature was this. They have pinpointed it to an exact science, which is really a quite amazing if you think about it. So these ice cores, they've got data dating far back beyond even this time, and they found evidence in these ice cores of cooling conditions based partly on those oxygen isotopes and partly on the, another cool thing about this, which you think about ice, it's, it's cold and it's dense, but ice can trap tiny, tiny little bubbles of air. So if you've got a, a ring from down here of your ice that say was deposited in the year 1200 AD 
and it's got a little tiny bubble trapped in it, that bubble serves as an example of what the atmosphere was like at that time. So they can say there was this much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in the year 1200. So it's like an actual bubble of air. So they can use that. Another interesting thing is that they dug up some of these dead Vikings on Greenland. Um, I guess that's what you do when you go to Greenland. And they analyzed the amount of oxygen, heavy oxygen in their teeth. Because as a living thing, you all have oxygen in you. So these people, they were also living at one time. Everything that's living has oxygen in it. And because they had oxygen in them, they too were reflective of the environment at the time. So it wasn't only the oxygen in this ice here that could record the ratio of heavy oxygen to normal oxygen. It was also the oxygen in people's teeth. So they could det determine from these ratios in these human teeth and human remains, oh, people who died around this time, they have a different ratio in their teeth and therefore it looks like cold was probably a stress on them. Another thing that we have is paleopaleological paleo, evidence, <laughs> I can usually say that, it's, it's the end of a long week, evidence. And this is people who study fossilized pollen and spores. So next time you hate your job, think about these people who are analyzing fossilized pollen and spores. They dig it out of the rock. Their pollen is actually remarkably preserved because it's got a hard outer shell called sporopollenin. It's able to be preserved in rock for literally millions and millions of years. And pollen, of course, is an in indicator of what types of plants were around at the time. So they are able to look at the pollen from that time and say, oh, these plant assemblages were here. We don't find these plant assemblages in Greenland anymore. We find them way far south of Greenland. So we know it must have been a lot warmer then. And those are actual pictures of pollen taken with a microscope. So we're going we're gonna to shift gears a little bit. We've been talking about how it was so warm during the years 800 and 1200. We're going to look at the last 1,000 years as far as the Little Ice Age is concerned. So if you look back about 1,000 years, the climate's actually been cooler than normal. And we call the period from 1300 to 1850 the Little Ice Age. Now, it wasn't a real ice age. It wasn't a big ice age where you had glaciers covering much of the planet. But it was named the Little Ice Age by people living in northern Europe in the years 1300 to 1850. They didn't have indoor plumbing. They didn't have space heaters. They were living in cold castles. And it probably felt like an ice age to them. So that's what, it, that's what it's named. The beginning of the Ice Age is suspect in the death of the Norse Greenland civilizations, and it's also got other stuff associated with it. And this is just a nifty graph, uh, graph showing you um, how much cooler it was. And here, this is an interesting spike. It shows you what's going on today, how much warmer it is. So there we go. Just for contrast, there's that squiggly graph again. Medieval climatic optimum, and you can see how rapidly, what an abrupt change was that. It just dropped off and never recovered until several hundred years later. So you can imagine what a shock this was to people living in Northern Europe. And we do have evidence that the Little Ice Age occurred and the medieval climatic optimum occurred other places than Northern Europe, but our best records are actually from Northern Europe. So that's largely what we are focusing on. So let's talk about what the Little Ice Age did. It had a pretty significant impact on agriculture, especially agriculture in Northern Europe. So in Norway, for example, the land of the Vikings, crop yields in 1387 were between 12% and in the best case scenario, it was 70% of what it had been only 87 years earlier, which to you might seem like a long time, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not. So that's a problem. Think about it, you still probably got the same number of people to feed, but you're not making nearly as many crops. Scotland also had problems a little bit further south. Scotland had many years of food scarcity. They had famine, which is people going hungry because there wasn't enough food. Livestock loss, which can also contribute to famine. Um, Scotland is notorious for growing sheep, which were used as food sources and for their wool to keep people warm. If you look at this, I know that's a busy, ugly graph, 
But this is really interesting for a number of reasons. One, it shows actual records of Scotland crops. And you can see from about 1550, which is when the Little Ice Age got even worse than it had back then, all the way through 1700, somebody bothered to take the time to record years. These are farming logs. The pe farmers were good at about taking notes on, well, I lost a lot of my crops this year, or I just lost all of my sheep. And you can see there were lots of famine years, there were lots of local dearths, lack of food, and lots of general dearths, like countrywide. And you can see there were some really bad years for losing sheep. So they couldn't have their haggis, which is probably a good thing. You all know what haggis is, yes? It's, it's oatmeal boiled in a sheep's stomach with chopped up heart and lungs. It's as good as it sounds. <laughs> Forests are another in interesting indicator of climate. One of the things that we found in northern Europe was that beech trees, and that's a beech leaf in that top picture there, were gradually replaced with oak and pine. Oak and pine trees grow at, at altitude and at high latitudes for a reason. They are much more cold tolerant than beech trees. Beech trees need it to be a little bit warm and on the temperate side. So over time, what they noticed was that beech trees were dying out and being replaced with oak and pine. And another interesting thing is that some scientists think that even today, especially with all the rapid changes we have in our climate, that forests are still in disequilibrium with the environment. So you had these, some of these tree species were dying out and being replaced with other ones, and you know trees are very long lived, so the assemblages are going to change very gradually. And we think that the assemblages of trees in the forest that we have today are not quite in equilibrium with the climate yet because things have just been shifting so rapidly. So the Little Ice Age also had a pretty big impact on the health of people in Europe and other parts of the world also, but. One of the big crops in Scotland, especially, was rye. That's where the song on a body meets a body coming through the rye came, came from. You know that one? You want to sing it? No? Maybe later. Maybe at the end. But this is, this is a picture of rye right there. And when you get cooler conditions and damper conditions, you can get something called ergot growing on your rye. Now what would happen was they would grow this during the summer and they would harvest it in the late summer, early fall, and they would store it for the winter in silos and then they would, they would grind it up and they'd be able to bake bread all winter. So if your climate suddenly gets colder and damper, your ergot is going to start to sprout on your rye, unbeknownst to you. Why is this a problem? Well, your ergot's sitting around hanging out in your silo on your grain and as it's doing that it can ferment a little bit and it can ferment just enough to make a drug that's very similar to LSD which is a popular hallucinogen or I guess it was once upon a time. Um, so some historians actually blame some of the witchcraft hysteria that went on in the 1600s on hallucinations caused by ergot blight. So think about it. You got this rye, you're storing it, it grows some ergot, you grind it up, you bake bread, your whole family starts tripping. <laughs> and then they start seeing things. Maybe they, the, part of the thing with the witchcraft hysteria was they would say, well, she turned me into a newt or, or something like that, or she, she caused my cow to grow wings and fly. Maybe these people actually really did think they were seeing these things because they were tripping on ergot. So part of why this is corroborated is because some of the most extensive witch hunts when they had this whole witchcraft hysteria were during the worst years of the Little Ice Age. Years when it would have been coldest and dampest and you would have had the most ergot blight. Another thing that compounded this problem was that weather making was one of the things that they thought these witches, alleged witches, could do. So you think about, well, your crops died or your, all, you lost all your sheep, you want to blame somebody. And you say, well, I, an, I need a scapegoat for this. And they blamed part of this on these witches because, well, 
my sheep died, somebody must be to blame, witches can make weather, she must have made it so cold, and plus I saw her flying on a broom over my house, well there you go, case, case solved. Another problem that we had with health in the Little Ice Age was that lack of crops meant a lot more people went undernourished. One of the things that I use as an example when I talk about this with my college students is I say, do you notice you always get sick during finals week? That's because you're stressed out and you're eating food from the vending machine. So you're not eating well, your, your body is stressed, and that's essentially what went, out, went on. You're not eating as well as you can, your immune system's not as strong as it can be, and with the Black Plague that was going around that wiped out one-third of Europe's population, people had weakened immune systems from not being able to eat properly, and they were more susceptible to the Black Plague. So historians think that possibly because of the poor crop conditions that went along with these much cooler climates, that that contributed to the such massive loss of life during the Black Plague that wiped out all of Europe's pop or most so, so many people in Europe at the time. So had conditions not been so cold, we might have been in better shape. Now, 1816 is notorious because it was called the year without a summer. So not only do you have the Little Ice Age going on where things are pretty seriously cooled down from what you're used to to begin with, but there was a big volcanic eruption in April of 1815 called Mount Tambora. It was in Indonesia, and this is, it was on this island here, and you can see right here, this is Southeast Asia, right there. So this little Pacific volcano. You say, well, how could that possibly have impacted Europe? Well, you can notice that the 1816 was the year but without a summer, but April 1815 was the year that the volcano erupted. So it's a delayed effect, but this volcanic eruption was so massive that it spewed ash and dust that eventually were able to blanket the globe. Not like a big, thick, heavy blanket, but it was enough to alter the climate and it reached as far as northern Europe which is why you had things like heavy snow falling in June and you had killing frosts in July and August which is when your crops are going to be hopefully at their peak and you're getting ready to harvest them. So if you garden at all you know a killing frost is a, when it gets cold enough that you can get frost on your plants and it will kill them, hence the name killing frost. <laughs> I don't think that needs much explanation but a lot of my students don't want know what that is. Uh, so some things that we have in the record as evidence for 1816, New England, crop failures are reported and recorded. Vermont reported snowdrifts of 30 inches in June. I guess that's not that unusual today, is it? Uh, no? Well, yeah, actually, even for Vermont, that's a lot. England had the third coldest summer on record since 1659 when they started actually keeping real temperature records. And Ireland recorded rain on 142 out of 153 days between May and September. So let's say you are a denizen of England or Ireland, Ireland and let's say you have money and the means to get the heck out for a few days and go on vacation. Are you going to do it? Oh yeah, you are. And that was a good thing for some of us. Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, she was a famous author, and she and her husband were English citizens, and summer of 1816, they were really bummed. It was raining all the time, it was cold, and they said, let's go to Switzerland, it has to be better there. Well, it wasn't, because the whole world was essentially in the grips of this cold spell, and they were also feeling the effects of that Mount Tambora eruption. So, they took their family there, and they w met some other friends, including Lord Byron, who's another famous author. And they found, well, it's not any better here, so they had to stay inside, and they entertained themselves. How else do you entertain yourself on vacation? You tell German ghost stories. That's what, that's what we all do, right? Nothing scarier than a German ghost story. So they, that inspired them to challenge each other to write a story. And this is where Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. So Frankenstein was written in because of we because of the year without a summer. She was on vacation. They stayed in and wrote stories, and she eventually got this published. And 
I guess the rest is history. So without all these climatic variables, we would never have had Frankenstein, for whatever that's worth. We also wouldn't have had young Frankenstein, if that makes you feel any better. So this is a picture. This is our picture that we had on the advertisements for this talk. And it's just, these are sort of rhetorical questions there. What do you notice about this picture? Well, it's called winter, so you say, well, well, duh, it's winter, so there, of course there's snow. But if you look at it, if you look at the sky and the general environmental feel, you say, well, it's dark, it's gray, it's cloudy. And this, this artist, Lucas van Valkenborg, was Dutch. It was painted during the Little Ice Age around 1586. And this picture, it turns out, is not so unique. Art has been studied as an indicator of climate of the past. Now, they couldn't go out with their little camera phones back in 1585 and take a picture of the environment. So what did they do? They painted. And this guy Newberger, back in 1970, spearheaded this. And more studies have been done. But he studied, presumably with a lot of graduate students, more than 41,000 paintings in US and European museums. And they developed an index. This isn't just random sightings. They actually developed an index of blue sky visibility, low in convective clouds, cloudiness, and just generally dark paintings. And they made records of these for 41,000 paintings, and they noted the year that the painting was made. And they found that starting when the Little Ice Age got really bad, we established around 1550, that the incidence of low and convective clouds went up, just general cloudiness went up, and dark paintings went up. Visibility and blue skies went way, way down. So this is a case, art is an indicator of the environment, because it's what pe people painted what they saw in many cases. I don't know about Picasso, but at this time people painted what they saw. And they, this is recorded. This is an, an actual recorder of what went on at that time. So this is actually pretty interesting, I think. And there's some papers written on this that are, that are pretty good. So what does all this mean? This, the historical record, again, it's a, another type of proxy re data record. It doesn't necessarily give us numbers and data, but it does give us a picture of what went on. We can cor corroborate it with other evidence. So this is a picture of the grape harvest, and the grape harvest was really important during the medieval times because they didn't have TV or anything, so what did they do? They made wine. So the grape harvest was of vital importance. They kept detailed records of what was a good grape year, what was not a good grape year. And scientists who are savvy, if you look close to the edge of this graph here, those dotted lines there, they started putting those on when they actually had recordings of the temperature. And they could corroborate that with the grape harvest years, and then they could extrapolate that back to the earlier years when they don't have an instrumental record and make inferences about how warm and how cool it was. So we've looked a little bit about what climate issues have done in the past, especially the fairly recent past, and in the past as far as humans are concerned in, in terms of the historical record. But why is it such a big deal today? Well, if you think back to that example of the trees that we were talking about, how the forests are not in equilibrium, biomes, which are plant assemblages, may be permanently altered. You say, well, why do we care? That's a big deal if you are, say, a little specialized frog that needs a certain assemblage of plants to survive. So what we're looking at is a lot of extinctions because these vegetation changes are not able to keep up with climate changing so quickly and so permanently. Sea level may change. There are actually some Pacific islands right now where the inhabitants have had to leave and move to other islands because their island has been drowned out. So sea level is actually changing right now. We, we do see sea level changing at this time. Increased carbon dioxide in the air may change plant physiological processes. Plants process CO2 differently depending on their physiological pathway. We may see a shift in vegetation because of that. And those are just a few examples. This is sea level and that has been recorded in some European countries over the last 
Uh, well, let's see. Well, it depends on, the, uh, depends on the city, but we have records for Amsterdam dating back before the year 1700. And you can see that as you get close to the year 2000, sea level has risen significantly in these coastal towns. And we expect it will continue to do so. As the climate warms, that polar ice that we talked about, remember, that polar ice is unique as far as Earth's long-term record is concerned. That polar ice is melting. It's flooding the oceans and it's causing sea level to rise. So are we doing this? Are we fouling the nest? Yes. Any question now? Uh, <laughs> some people think that humans are not influencing climate change, but these are people that usually have an agenda or they're selling something. And we saw Earth's climate's always been in flux, right? You said, well, look at this. We just talked about all this natural variability. Yeah, that's true, but one of the smoking guns, as we call it for this, is if you look here, carbon dioxide, which is a very potent greenhouse gas, methane, nitrous oxide, sulfate aerosols, deposited in Greenland ice. Remember, we have records of Greenland ice going way, way, way back, even before 1400. If you look, these are all relatively flat. These go back to the year 1000 until about 1850. 1850 is when the Industrial Revolution started. This is when people started figuring out we can burn fossil fuels, we can make our lives easier with machines, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but all of that activity was putting junk into the atmosphere, and not coincidentally, a little bit after this is when we started to see Earth's climate get quite a bit warmer. This is a, it's a little bit of a confusing graph. I'm not going to belabor it too much, but this shows you anthropogenic and natural forcing for the year 2000 relative to 1750. And you can see the greenhouse gases have increased significantly, especially carbon dioxide relative to back before we started burning stuff. And one of the other very strong pieces of evidence. And these are from the IPCC, which, by the way, in case you're wondering who these people are, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. These are independent scientists from all different countries. They have no political agenda. They just care about science. And if you've ever met a scientist, you know that all they care about is science. <laughs> no, that's, that's entirely true. But they don't, they don't want to make a political statement. They just want to show the numbers. And this, what this shows here, Observations are the red lines and model results are the gray lines. So scientists like to run models. What would happen if we did this? And the models, you, people say, well, they're just models. They're not really good records. But if you take that model and you run it for the past and you match it up with actual observations, you can get pretty good corroboration of what act was going on. So here, if you look at natural forcing only, you can see there's a huge disjoint between model results and observations. If you look at just what humans have done, anthropogenic forcing, there is more of an alliance, especially in the latter half of the 20th century, but there's still a disjoint right about here. If you match natural pro plus anthropogenic forcing, they match up quite nicely. So this is another bit of evidence that humans are definitely contributing to, if not causing a great deal of climate change. And part of the problem here is if you look, an easy way to just look at this graph, the bigger the circle, the more the area is being impacted. And if you can just look very quickly, you can see the areas that are going to be most impacted are up here at the poles. The tropics, not so much. That's a big deal. If you're melting stuff at the poles, if you're changing the climate at the poles, you are melting the ice. You are also changing the reflectivity of Earth's surface. The ice is very reflective. It sends a lot of that incoming solar radiation back into space. You get rid of that ice, you replace it with something darker, it's going to warm the surface more rapidly, and it's going to be a cycle like this. So this is um, an integrated framework come up with, again, by these intergovernmental panel on climate change people. And you can see that it is a, a, an intricate web of issues, that climate change has some effects, and there are other things that are affecting climate change. So climate change, you get a temperature rise that's going to impact natural and human systems like food, health, as we talked about, human settlements that can influence technology, population. As we 
try to shift our lifestyle, our socioeconomic development path, that's going to impact the types of emissions we put in the atmosphere, and that in turn is going to affect climate change. So it's a complicated cycle, and there's, we haven't really come up with a lot of good answers to that yet. So just quickly to summarize, the historical record, human anecdotes, they're important. They are not just some fun stories from the past. They're an important part of our climate change record. And it's really good to put a human face on this and not just look at it from the point of view of numbers and data. It's important to realize, oh, our ancestors, even just 10 generations back, a very long time removed, we may not have even known who they were, were impacted by changes in the climate. So data, models, numbers, they're only part of the story. And for more people to appreciate environmental changes, I think we need to present this in more than scientific terms. It's one thing to say, oh, oh Earth is expected to warm 1.5 to 4.5 degrees Celsius in the next 100 years, and the average person is going to be like, eh, okay. But if you put a more human face on it, it might mean more to them, and they might be more inclined to care. So that is all I have. Thank you very much for attention, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take those. So that was a wonderful talk, a lot of great connections. Let's open the floor to questions. I'm sure there are many people that have questions, so. Yes. Um, because the oceans get warmer, because there's more, there's re less reflection by the ice, mm -hmm. doesn't, when the, war when the water gets warmer, there's more possibility of hurricanes, and I mean hurricanes, so when, then it would cause cold tracks and then the clouds would rebounce off the, um, what's it called, the, they would trap the cold air inside again and the earth will kind of fix itself. How much data is there for that? So you're asking about, so if th the ice melts and we get more ocean, which is darker, we'll get more heat, more heat absorbed, which means more hurricanes, which in turn means more clouds, which will cool it down. Is that your question? Is that, is, like, how much is the data for that one? There are not a lot of data for that. However, one of the important things to keep in mind is that hurricanes are fairly short-lived and they are localized events. So the cloud cover from a hurricane, first of all, it's going to be, it's not going to be polar. It's going to be more tropically to temperately located. And it's also going to be more ephemeral. So in the long run, I can't see increased hurricanes having a significant effect on the albedo of Earth or the reflectivity. But the cloud cover because at, one, any point, at any one point in time, the Earth is covered in about 65% of the Earth is covered in clouds, and mm -hmm. clouds play a very drastic role in the temperature regulation of the Earth. So the, the Earth, yes, the Earth is covered, to your question, the Earth is covered by a significant number of clouds, so you're saying that we think we'll see an increase in cloudiness. There have been studies on that, and some studies show that clouds will increase, and other studies show that clouds will decrease. And so the jury is out on that. There's also, there's a difference in the t what the type of cloud does. So low clouds versus high clouds. We're not sure how the balance of low versus high clouds will shift, but low clouds tend to be insulating. They tend to trap the heat in. High clouds tend to be more reflective. They'll tend to reflect more of the solar radiation back into space. And there have been some studies to look at, well, what would happen? And still, we don't have good data on that. But the consensus is even the change in cloud cover, even if we did get a significant change in cloud cover, it's not going to stop the warming from continuing because the greenhouse gases are just too much to, to mitigate any change in cloud cover. No, I answered everybody's question. That's a good talk when I answer everybody's question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Which industries do you think uh, have had the biggest impact on the environment? Which industries do I think have had the biggest impact on the environment? Any industry that puts sulfates or nitrates or carbon dioxide into the environment is a big one. They have done studies on this and they have shown that transportation is one of the biggest contributors of greenhouse gases. And that's not just cars, that includes mass transportation and planes. So transportation as a whole is the biggest slice of that pie. Uh, 
industry, just general industry factories that produce things are the second largest contributor. And they, they have actually looked at who is the biggest contributor to this. So transportation was number one and industry was number two and other stuff fell far short. A lot of people wanted to blame um, farming for a while. They said, well, cows, they're flatulent. They put methane in the air, but really cows can't poot that much that they're going to change the climate. If, so the question if everyone became vegetarian, it would reduce the CO2 output by 30 percent. And I don't, I have not seen that study. It would not surprise me because it takes a lot more food and it takes a lot more energy to produce a pound of meat than it does to produce a pound of grain. So, and also, there's also transportation to and from. If people eat more locally grown produce, then you can save on emissions and et cetera. So I think. The argument can be made that a more local, environmentally friendly diet certainly could impact um, our climate issues, and I, I agree with that completely. Yes. What, what about um, like uh, volcanoes that erupt and, and you know spew ash in, into the atmosphere, blot out the sun, and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing? Do they do they keep a track of say what happened during the years of Mount Pinatubo? Or Mount St. Helens or even Krakatoa, who, uh, I think it had a great effect on the climate. And that's a, that's a good question, too. Uh, these are all good questions. About volcanoes, do they keep track of the effects that these volcanic eruptions have? And yes, the Mount Tambora example is, I think, one example that was the year without a summer. But when Mount Pinatubo erupted, they did track what happened. And volcanoes, they can have a profound but short-lived effect. So one of the things that they can do, as we saw, was that they can cause a blanket of ash and dust and gases to cover the earth for maybe a year or so, and they can have an impact on climate for a short period of time, but it's not going to be a long-term type of impact. But they, they do. There are scientists who study the effects of these volcanic eruptions on climate. And they have found that they, they may be very profound, but they usually don't last more than, say, five or so years. What about Fukushima, Chernobyl, the maybe radiation? Does that have any effect on the atmosphere as well? Do they know yet? Does the radiation, does the radiation from Fukushima or Chernobyl have an effect on the atmosphere? As far as we know, no. I have not seen any studies. Um, sure, the local. Radiation can drift. If it gets high enough in the atmosphere, it can get on the jet stream and it can be carried. So certainly it's not, it's not necessarily local, but I don't think there have been studies or any significant findings about radiation impacting the climate. Radiation has its other immediate problems that I, that I think scientists have focused more on when it, with a disaster of that nature. Because if you're dead from radiation, it doesn't matter if the climate's changing. Yes? Hi, um, I heard, like, I think I was like watching the news or something like that, and I heard of a uh, group of people, I guess an organization, that's thinking of throwing up some type of sulfur compound into the atmosphere mm -hmm. to reflect the sunlight and uh, try to counter global warming. I just wanted to know if you had like heard of that before and what your opinion on it is. So the organization wants to put sulfur in the atmosphere to... So some kind of sulfur compound in the atmosphere that's supposed to reflect the sunlight. That's going to reflect the sunlight, okay. Um, I think I have heard something about this. I don't think I've heard a lot about it. It sounds like a really bad idea. <laughs> You're just putting more stuff in, and you, you don't necessarily know what it's going to do and it's not necessarily going to reflect more and it reminds me of a like the Simpsons episode where they have to keep putting bigger and bigger ice cubes in the ocean in order to keep it from warming. I just don't see that as being a long-term solution to what's become essentially a very big global problem. But I'd have to look into that more to in answer your question a little more intelligently. Sorry. <laughs>
There are a lot of modeling issues. The question is what kind of modeling issues have been put together to figure out how everything works. And there have been, uh, there have been extensive modeling initiatives dating back a few decades now to look at the interaction. And that was part of what we were looking at in that one slide with the model. Those models don't just incorporate atmospheric variables. They incorporate as many variables as they can. Places like the National Center for Atmospheric Research, where I work, they have scientists with all types of niche specialties. And they come together and they create a dialogue on, well, here are the ecological impacts. Here are the physical impacts. Here are the physics equations that you need to describe this. And it's, it's a very complicated array. And models have come a long way since uh, the days when I was at Penn State, when the computer that I worked on was about half the size of this room. Now you can do it on a little, yeah, now I'm, make, I'm old. Uh, now you can do it on like a little Unix or a, a Mac. So models have definitely improved and they're getting better still. So we're, as we realize more what the environmental factors are that, that are at, at stake here, we're, we're incorporating more of them into the models. As far as I know, there is not anything competing. Uh, the climate scientists, they're, they're pretty unified in their goal is just to find out what's going on. They, there's not a lot of competition that I'm familiar with. Uh, doesn't mean it's not there, but if there is, it's not, it must be very minimal. So as far as I know, there's not competition. What about the depletion of aquifers? What effect does that have on? The aquifers. The depletion of aquifers. The depletion of aquifers. How is that being impacted? Yeah, how does it impact? What, it does, it, what does it do to the atmosphere or, or the climate? What does the depletion of aquifers do to the climate? Well, one of the things that the climate does to the depletion of aquifers is that as it gets more arid and more, um, as it gets warmer, places like the Midwest right now, the Great Plains states, where a lot of our agriculture is grown, they have a system called pivot irrigation. And if you've ever flown on a plane and you've looked down and you've seen circular farms and you wonder what's the deal, why is that farm a circle and not a square, that's because they have a system called pivot irrigation which is on 24 hours a day. And it's essentially a big wheel and it's got its axis in the center of the circle here and it rotates around and it's draining the aquifer and it's running 24 hours a day. So Things like the Ogallala Aquifer, which is in Nebraska, they've seen that decrease over the last 50 to 60 years or so. It's gone down quite a bit to the point where farmers are worried that their, their children are not going to have enough water to farm in that area because the aquifer has been so depleted because it's gotten warmer and their crops need more water. So not only do they have these pivot irrigation systems running 24-7, they need to run them higher in order to keep their plants alive. And that in turn, that creates a microclimate in the area where you get a more humid type of environment. But as far as the big global scale is concerned, it hasn't had a big global impact. The depletion of aquifers is more, much more of a local scale issue. But it, it is important it, and it's a chicken egg thing. It's a cyclical thing. Seems like a lot of countries, ours included, seem to struggle with coming to agreement on the international level on, you know, doing something about uh, global warming. Mm -hmm. So this isn't so much of a question, but I'd like to just hear your comments on that and what you think it might really take um, before countries will come to some agreement to be able to make real solutions. So just. To summarize, you think that many countries, including us, are being very slow to do anything about what is obviously an issue, and what what will it take to to slap us upside the head? All oh, those those are not your words. I won't pretend those were your <laughs> words. And that is, if I had that answer, I would be very wealthy. <laughs> and it's. It, it's complicated. I think what it comes down to, especially in this country, is money. I think economically it's very hard for people to shift out of, well, I drive my car. What do you mean you want me to drive an electric car? Where am I going to plug it in? There really isn't the infrastructure for that right now. And also, so many people have their livelihoods in things like, like coal mining, and it's just a way of life. There's also, people are very resistant to change. 
if you may have noticed this in yourself, if somebody changes something on you, like if somebody went into your house and put your dishes in a different cabinet, you'd be like, hey, wait a minute, you'd move them back. So I think that's just human nature is to be very resistant to change. So I think that's one big hump to overcome, but I think economics is what it really comes down to, is that we have to make it financially, economically attractive for people to want to change. So like if all the the best cars were suddenly solar powered, then then that would be a more attractive option. But that that is oversimplifying the situation, I believe. But yeah, I do believe it comes down to money. It's, yes. Well, there's also I, I read a, a quote from somebody, and unfortunately I don't remember who it was. You might recognize it. Mm -hmm. uh, that says uh, the science rarely convinces its critics; they just die. Yeah. Science advances one funeral at a time. Yeah, so science doesn't convince <laughs> its critics. The critics just the die. And the, the, I, I have heard a similar right. quote to that. I don't know to whom to attribute well, it. So if you look at the parallel between, say, evolution and, and climate change, which are the similarly life uh, altering theories, you know, it takes time for it to sink in. It takes some generations for it to sink in. Right. So, so some uh, of the problem will be solved just by the passage of time so the people who don't believe in climate change all pass away. <laughs> well, <laughs> if, we have the, if we have the time, right? Some of the, yeah, some of the problem may be solved by people who don't believe in it will just expire and move on. Um, if you look at evolution, which is your example, there are still people who... Yeah, so, it took a long time. So it's been 150 years. Yeah, it has been. And there, some of the, the more hardcore believers in the old theories will pass that on to future generations and raise their children that way. So I'm not, uh, it, but I think it could be just like a whole new generation of engineers and people with different ideas that it's going to take to convince us that, uh, well, here is an attractive new option that doesn't rely on fossil fuels or tired of breathing in this junk. Let's do something about it. I mean, I'm from New Jersey. I'm used to it, but it's it gets old after a while. In the face of, uh, of, of rapidly industrializing younger nations, it will take a lot longer for... Um, do you think it's possible for us to fix things before they mess them up worse with their, with their lessened economic restrictions? Uh, that's a good question. The question's about third world countries who are just becoming industrialized and is it possible for us to fix things before that really takes off and that that brings up a lot of interesting ethical dilemmas and that's something that a lot of climate scientists talk about. Like, is it fair to deprive these developing nations of the technology that could save people's lives or improve the quality of some people's lives and so I think a lot of those countries are smaller and they're not going to go like all global like the United States ha uses a much more of its share of the world resources than those smaller countries do. So I think ultimately in the long run uh, industrializing smaller countries will have a minimal impact and of course the goal is for the, the world leaders to develop better technology so we can then pass that on and we don't feel like well, these smaller countries, they have to depend on coal. Well, we have this better technology. We're going to share this with you, which is a whole other issue. But I, I think in the long run, the ethical thing to do is not to deprive developing countries of what they need to make their citizens' lives better, because we will be able to replace that someday in, in rapid succession. Yes? So what's your take on tipping points? Tipping Particularly points? melting permafrost, uh, methane clathrates, uh, uh, having an event such as perhaps the PDTM? Those are good questions. So tipping points. I think tipping points are, they haven't been that, that well studied, but if you look, if we look, remember that graph, the, 
that serious drop off between the medieval warm period and the little ice age that was a pretty dramatic change that happened over the span of a relatively short period of time even from a human point of view and i think that raises a really good point that we may reach that balance of we've lost just enough ice to cause like the collapse of a massive ice sheet we've lost the structure of this that ice sheet's going to fall into the ocean there's all kinds of ocean convection that that transports heat around the world so i think there is a very delicate balance and i think there's more to the story because those tipping points are the are the critical things there that um like loss of permafrost you look at trucking for example they can't drive as far north on the ice as they could all year because the permafrost just isn't there so i think we need to look into that more because like, it, all it takes is one ice sheet collapse for everything to change and that, that's it. That things will be as we never knew them before. A tipping point, seven billion people, over seven billion people. Everyone has a need to stay warm, to yep. eat, I mean, to provide your people. Population as a tipping point. Population can certainly be a tipping point also. Uh, a lot of the growth of the population is in non-industrialized countries but again that brings back to this question is we are industrializing those countries so yeah population is something to keep in mind also we have people to feed and clothe and house and keep warm and get places so that that's a that's another really good point and like i said i don't have the answers i can address this as intelligently as i can but if i had the answers i probably would have a, a different job <laughs> Medicine is advancing. People are living longer through medicine and yes. medicine improvements and that much. People are living longer. They, you know, they're cloning to reproduce and uh, doing all sorts of things that seem to me to be unnatural. Yes. You know, but the population, everything to me, all of this comes down to population. You're right. All of it does come down to population, and it is ironic that we are living longer and we've made advances in medicine, so and that contributes to it. We, it, uh, well, we're on the verge of some kind of new yeah, world. I'm not. Like, oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> so, things are things are going to be different. Um, probably not within our lifetimes, but certainly with the life within the lifetimes of our children and grandchildren. Well, my daughter is six, so she may may see this in her old age. And, but yeah, like there are a lot of variables at play here, which is part of why there's so much uncertainty, and it's really hard to address the problem with a simple solution. Say, that here's what we need to do. It's it's a very complicated interplay of factors. Some of the solutions are going to seem drastic, cruel. Some of the solutions could seem drastic and cruel, which goes back to, like, do we take away the technology of, say, some sub-Saharan African country that's starting to make a better life for its citizens? No, you, you, you just don't do that. But the outcome is liable to be just as cruel. Yes. Maybe even worse. Or, or worse. The outcome, yeah. it could be just as cruel so or it worse. Might be just the end of the whole world. Could be the end of the world. Does anybody else feel a need for a beer? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask one last question, Jennifer. You talked about, not on the last plot in particular, but how the pr model predictions are for global climate change. I wonder if you've looked at some of the model predictions for just Virginia or southeastern United States. What do the forecasts, uh, these model forecasts, call for changes in the climate here and in this region? That's a good question. Um, I have looked at model forecasts for southeastern Pennsylvania, which is pretty close right. to Virginia, and what they're calling for are increases in temperatures and increases in aridity or a decrease in rainfall. So they're expecting at least part of the eastern seaboard to get not only warmer, but also drier, which you can see where that's going as far as crops and, and stuff like that is concerned. So yeah, with Certainly in Harrisonburg, we have a very large farming community. And part of the research I did when I was in Pennsylvania was on how is this going to impact the local farmers, many of whom have been farming for generations. And the answer is not 
a, a happy one. They're going to have a much harder time farming their crops. And a lot of them have already turned to genetically modified crops, which is a whole other issue in and of itself, which you don't want to get me started on. So let's thank Dr. Megan for a fantastic talk. Oh, thank you very much.